Thanks for staying with us on News Hub and welcome to Open Day. But before we go directly, there's something that we have to talk about today. And maybe your guess is as good as mine. Something happened in Nigeria on Thursday, 11th of Jan uh, February 2021. Uh, someone said a very big fish, you know, was lost in the ocean. And so a lot of great, great things being said about the great Lagosian who was governor for everyone, irrespective of where you came from. And so we want to talk about the life and times of former uh, and the late governor of Lagos State, uh, that's Latif Jakonde, who died at the age of 91 on Thursday. Jakonde was governor of Lagos State from 1979 to 1983, and later was minister of works under the Sonia Bacha military regime between 1993 and 1998. His committee of friends on Thursday announced that he will be buried on Friday, the 12th of February 2021, and the statement is signed by Professor Abis Lee, former Vice Chancellor, Lagos State University. Uh, he actually uh, said that he will be laid to rest at Bolt Gardens, Ikoi, at 4 p.m. on Friday, and that is today. And to talk about the life and times of late that Chief Jack on day joining us in the studios uh, is the man that you talk about when you talk about fixing Nigeria's politics. Mr. Hashtag Fix Politics is Anthony Ubani, Executive Director of Hashtag Fix Politics. Good morning, Anthony. Good morning. Thank so you nice. for having me. So nice to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Also joining us uh, is Deepo Olayo, mm. a Public Affairs Analyst. Deepo, good morning. So nice to have you on News Hub. You have to unmute your device so we can hear you. You have to unmute your device, Deepo. Okay, how are you? Can you hear me now? Fantastic. Cloud, clearly. Good, mo good morning. Good, good morning. morning. Thanks for joining us on News Hub. Also joining us today okay. is Lanre Arogundade, the Director of International Press Center. So nice to have you on the show, Lanre. Good morning. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thanks for having me. You're welcome aboard. Merci. All right. So let's start um, with... Our guest in the studio, Mr. Anthony, um, could you just take us down memory lane? What do you remember about the awesome late Alaji Latif Jakande? Thank you. Um, for one, I think I was, when he was governor, I was still living in Lagos State then, uh, way back um, in 83, thereabout when he was just coming in. And um, I do remember that he was a very simple man. He was a very humble man. He had no airs around him. Uh, you could see the sense of empathy around him. And um, again, when you look through his, his tenure of leadership, don't forget that he only served for one term. He served for just four years. Most Nigerians don't seem to remember that because you look, we look at the giant strides in terms of his accomplishments for those four years. So some people think perhaps this guy was in the system for eight years. No, he was there for just four years. And today, you go around Lagos State, you still see so many schools, they call Jack on the schools. You go around, you see so many estates that's called Jack on the estate. I mean, the, the evidence of his developmental effort, the evidence of his leadership is there. And in a, in a sense, you can tell very clearly that his leadership was anchored on service to the people. Um, amazing. Yes, amazing. it was basically, and that is why today you find that um, almost all the country, north, south, east, west, everybody, everybody is paying their condolences. Why? Is it the only governor that has died, a former governor that has died in recent time? No. It's just one reason. There's a hunger for good governance in this country. There's a hunger for leadership in this country. And when Nigerians see good leadership, when they see good governance, they appreciate it. So the outpouring of emotion, of affection you see today for Jakonde is because they recognize that here was a leader who came, who served genuinely. And now it's time for us to show that, yes, we did appreciate his times. Thank you, Anthony, yes. for your opening remarks. Now let's go to Deepo Olayokun to get your opening remarks. Who was the Latif Jakonde that you knew or heard about or read about? Yeah, yeah thank you very much. <laughs> Latif Jakonde, I would say, represents the best in us. Anytime you, that, that's why some of us think there's a need for us to reintroduce the study of history because something sad happened yesterday. <clears throat> I came across a boy, a guy rather, and he came to me and said, sir, there have been this uh, so much uh, noise about the demise of one man that he has heard so much about him. 
that he thought the man was an industrialist. I said, how do you mean? And because everywhere you get to, you see houses, you see schools that were built by the man, that he must be a rich man. And I just shook my head. We can't hear you anymore, Depot. We'll try to fix um, the technical glitch as much as possible. Let's hear your, you know, that your loving, writing. you know, uh, comments about uh, uh, the leads. Alaji Latif Jakonde, um, Larry Arugundade. Much. Um, I think that uh, when we talk of Jakonde, we're talking of uh, what we should see in leaders that genuinely have the interests of the people at heart. And just like uh, you know, the first speaker said, uh, this was somebody who ruled Lagos for just four years and three months, and uh, the achievements are all there to see. Uh, some of them I, I need to emphasize. For example, so in a sense, we could say that Jack Conde is actually the architect of what we could call the modern Lagos. He had that vision as far back as that 1979, that Lagos needed a mass transit system and initiated uh, what was then called the mono train. And but for the coup of uh, the Buari, of uh, Buari and the Diagon in December 1983, uh, Lagos, as far back as 1983, will have started enjoying in a mono train, which was the first stage of the mass transit system that he was going to introduce in Lagos. And at the same time, he also introduced you know the waterways mass transit system, and launched a series of ferries that were called you know Babakekere, which was the nearest that Jack only went to in terms of uh, maybe naming things after himself. But the reality was that when you look at all those housing estates that Jack Conde built across Lagos, none of it was named after him. None of it was even named after Chief Obafemi Awolowo, who was the political leader of the Unity Party of Nigeria there. But the people, in recognition of who he was, just instinctively or spontaneously named all those housing estates. That's why till today, you go to any part of Lagos, what you see, uh, you hear Jack Conde, you hear Jack Conde, you hear Jack Conde. And like Mr. Lyokun was said, said, it's possible for a younger person to wonder whether this Jack Conde was an industrialist. This was a, a political leader. Not only that, because we're looking at you know the kind of leader that he was. He, he was humble. He was simple in office. His official car was his Toyota Crown. Why was the student union leader at the University of Ife in uh, 1983? And that was before the coup. And I, around that time, he came you know between 79 and 83. He came to Ife to deliver a lecture. And it was after that lecture when we were seeing him off as student union leaders uh, that we saw that he came in that to enter crime. But not only that, somebody just emerged from the crowd and, you know, the Jack on days were saying, oh, well, which car would you go with us to Lagos? It turned out that Jack on this daughter was a fellow student at the University of Ife, now back from my old university. But you never knew that, you know, so, so the simplicity of you know, the, simple, the simple life he led also reflected you know, in the lifestyle of his children to the extent that the daughter was in school and nobody knew because she wasn't riding any you know, a Jeep or any other thing you know, like that. But we must also talk about that because of what he did for the media. And this is one area that we can also say that in fact, he laid the foundation for most of what we're doing in the media today. Uh, Jack only brought the International Press Institute to Nigeria and used the instrumentality of that to establish the Nigerian Institute of Journalism, the first journalism training you know, institution uh, established by media organizations, the Nigerian Union of Journalists, Nigerian Guild of Editors, and the Newspaper Proprietors Association of Nigeria, of which he was also a leader. And it was through that that he also facilitated the acquisition of land and the building of what we call the NIJ Lighthouse on Victoria Island and the NIJ itself. Uh, before then, Jack Conde had been managing uh, editor and managing director of Nigerian Tribune. And if the, the Tribune newspapers remain what it is today, a major media institution, it was also to the extent of the kind of work that a person like you know, Jack Conde did. And so you could go on and on. But we also have to talk about education, the vision that Lagos one day would need a university. The Lagos State University was you know, conceptualized and started in All 1983. Right. 
Larry, we we're going to education. We've talked about how uh, the fact that people even assumed that he was an industrialist before they discovered that he was a politician and, in fact, a journalist. Let's go back to Deepo. We'll come back to Anthony in a moment. Deepo, sorry we lost uh, that connection with you earlier on. I asked you about the leader, Chief Jack Ondit, that you knew. Who was he to you? Y y yes, he was a great man. And then, uh, without uh, sounding... Uh, extravagant in the use of word. I think he was the greatest of them all. Actually, we are looking at the governors between 1979 and 1983. Papa Jack Onde packed an achievement of 120 years into a four-year tenure. And you see, he was guided by his political party. Like I said, before he got into politics, he was a journalist. I think Larry has uh, delved extensively on that issue, that uh, he was also a publisher. At least, uh, this, uh, there's this uh, thing they call John West publication uh, was owned by Babata Conde. Now, I said his achievement of, uh, was predicated on the political party. Maybe as we, the discussion goes on, we will now be looking at the role a political party can play in the art of governance. You know, he, he was of the UPN stock, and UPN had what they call the four cardinal programs, or four cardinal points, free education, free health, housing, and uh, I call it job for all and stuff like that. So the issue of the housing is just one of the four cardinal points of the political party. That is UPN. Then we go into education. You, you see, if you are looking at to understand Obata Konde very well, Obata Konde, the moment he was announced as the winner, he started playing the role of a governor to the extent that the governor then, the military governor then, had to tell him that, please, I think it was, I think, I can't remember very well. I think I agree or can that uh, please, sir, you have to tread slowly because your tenure has not been studied. And Mwada Kondi became a governor at a time when the educational system in Lagos was in crisis, in crisis of overpopulation of students. There were no classrooms to accommodate students. So they now broke the student, the, the, the scholarship of education in Lagos State into about one, two, or three sessions, morning session, the afternoon session, and possibly the evening session. But when Mwada Kondi came, he revolutionized this educational system by building what some people were deriding then. He was building schools, and they were calling them uh, poultry, just to let you know how opposition can go. But interestingly today, that same poultry had, promoted, had produced professors that have been vice chancellors of universities, that have been chief medical directors. That thing they call, uh, they, they call the poultry. Because he was able to streamline the educational system in Lagos, such that they now have only one session, by building schools. And you see, the rate at which they build these schools is still something that people could not comprehend. Very simple. But yet it was able to dish out fantastic educational policy so that we now have those who are making waves, or those who have made waves, who have retired, pass through these schools that they call poetry. So there's no way we can discuss what that in a one in one hour in a one hour program. That is why some of us are saying that there should be the introduction of history into the curriculum of our schools, so that children will know who Babada Kondi is, who was Strada. So that people, children will know that they used to be a Nigeria that produced somebody like Babada Kondi. That governance in Nigeria has not always been like a merchandise that we are, as we are witnessing today. That governance in Nigeria at the stage was service to the people, selfless service to the people. Like uh, Lanre said, Babada Kondi throughout his tenure was choosing his Toyota crown. As a matter of fact, he was not living in any government house. He was not living in any diary. He was living in his personal house, built from his sweat. That is what you don't know how selfless service, what it means. That, you see what happened there, you meet him. There was no that uh, very air of simplicity. No paramephalia or paramephalia of office that as you are witnessing today. So I, I think, uh, like I said, we cannot discuss about that one one hour. But we just believe that it should be a role model. Maybe this will now be an opportunity for scholars to now delve into making on anything who Babaja Kondi was for the current generation so that they will know that there is, there is grace in selfless service. And that is why Nigerians are showing it to him today. He was the greatest of the governors we had there. And he amplified the DPN of that time. That's why I threw the, the four Katina programs that the party introduced at that time. Awesome one, Deepo. Thank you so much for that contribution. Let's head back to the studio where Anthony is. I want to, you to tell us the key principles that guided 
um, late Alaji Latif um, administration that is lacking in today's leaders, you know, and how they can imbibe it to be able to achieve the things and even more than he did for today's generation. Right. Uh, it comes down to leadership and good governance. Two, two simple words, leadership and good governance. And I think Elijah Latif Jaconde understood very clearly that everything rises and falls on leadership. Yeah. And when you talk of leadership and good governance, it's simply service to the people. Any leadership in any, in any uh, contest that is not about service is not leadership. You can call it by any other name. Yeah. As long as it's not service, then it's not leadership. And that's what he pe personifies. And that's why people are so moved, you know, by his passing. At the end of the day, if you look at the whole tenure, the whole four years tenure, you see that everything he did in terms of policy, in terms of action, in terms of infrastructure, whatever, it was for the common good. It was for the common good of the people of Lagos State and for Lagos State to build Lagos State. And you can see examples of all of his leadership everywhere. Here was a man who didn't see impossibility, who felt that with what he had at that time, that Lagos could be different. I mean, um, uh, my colleague over there made a point earlier that we could have had the uh, monorail today, if not for the coup that happened. Lagos would have been the first state that could have had that. Two of the key institutions that we have in the state was the initiative of al Haji Jaconde. I went to Lagos State University, we are foundation student, that was his initiative. I went to Nigerian Institute of Journal Journalism, that was his in initiative. Wow. And that's just one governor who served just for four, four years, just one governor. His landmark, the imprint of his leadership is everywhere. Absolutely. So coming back to your question again, what exactly we are missing today is that sense of service. That sense of service, that sense of commitment to the people, that understanding that the citizens are king, that the citizens are indeed the ones that we are serving, that leadership is to serve the people and not otherwise. What we have today are people serving their personal interests. That's what we have generally. People are in leadership serving their personal interests. Here was a man that led with absolute humility. He, he, he came to work with his own car. Hmm. He lived in his own house, not in government quarters. There were no heirs around him. There were no heirs around his children. Hmm. And yet he served with complete decency and integrity. And this is exactly the message of fixed politics. Leadership that is values-based. Leadership that is grounded in service to the people, two key principles. And Al Haji Jaconde is indeed a good example of a values based leader and a leader who came to serve his people and he did very well, and the testimonies are out there to show. All right, thank right. you so much, Anthony. Now, in case you're wondering, uh, I read something up about uh, late Latif Jaconde on the <coughs> fact that uh, late Chief Awolo encouraged him to go into politics, mm. that in 1979 he vied to be executive governor of Lagos State and won. He actually defeated Adeniru Obusoye of MPP. And then you had the Unity Party of Nigeria, UPN, and the MPP. And that takes us to the next question, Larry Arubundade, back to the last place where you stopped. Okay, and they're talking about political party ideology and good governance. All right, the UPN then were known for education was key, welfareism and what have you. And so people like myself also enjoyed free education. I met at this primary school of Benabe, and perhaps my secondary school days. Mm. And we had this 2D, 2D notebook. Right. And it's 2D one that have red, blue, and another black. So if you were learning how to write your, your letters, you first, you, that D would touch the upper. All of these were the things that were you know, promoted by the uh, administration under the UPN then, uh, which uh, Jack on this set. What would you talk about? comparing the life and time of uh, Laji Lakonde, Jakonde, and the, uh, the, the things I was able to do along the party line in comparison yeah. to what obtains today uh, among the parties that are in government, to those that are even rooted to govern us. Well, in the first instance, uh, the, the Unity Party of Nigeria had an ideology which is called uh, you know, democratic uh, you know, socialism, and at the core of which was, uh, that was what uh, Awolowo himself espoused. And at the core of that was uh, the welfare of the people. Uh, incidentally, we were student socialists then, and we even felt that that wasn't, you know, the real, you know, uh, socialism that they were practicing. But on the basis of the fact that they had that vision, they were able to come up with the, the four cardinal program, which Mr. Alayoko talked about, that talked about free education, free healthcare, uh, you know, rural, you know, integration, 
and uh, you know infrastructural you know development so it, it was an all encompassing uh, you know program and every other person that came on the platform of that political party were armed with that you know program so you already knew that this was what where this political stand and that was what distinguished the second republic uh, politics even despite its limitations the fact that when you turn to a political party you knew what it, it stood for and what it was you know pursuing and the ABN then was the party of the elite but even as at that time NPN also, you know, had uh, agriculture as one of their, you know, major, you know, cardinal programs. So you had programs that you could, uh, you know, relate uh, relate with. Uh, so then the, the, the party discipline was also there in the sense that once you were elected, you were expected to pursue all these programs. So all the governors of the then UPN were simultaneously implementing and talking about these uh, programs. But in the case of Jack Onde, what we need to also emphasize is the fact that he actually invested in the people and showed us the power of the people in governance. And I'm going to explain this because these days when you look at those who are ruling us, it's like you can't do anything without what they call public-private partnership uh, to build roads now. Why is it that our roads are so expensive? Because the contracts are awarded to you know, multinational you know, companies uh, who build a lot of things into it. What people don't realize is that in those four years, Jack Conde did all that, built all those houses, constructed roads relying on the Lagos workforce. We're talking of, you know, workers of Lagos State. So the constructions were done by direct labor. So when people tell you that, oh, we're, we're, people are useless, we are not able to do anything, I think Jack Conde completely negated that. And one of the things he did that time was to establish what was called the Lagos Bulk Purchase. And that's, you know, a company bought building materials in bulk from manufacturers. So the cement were there, every other thing was there, and it was now left for the Lagos workforce, you know, through the Ministry of you know, Works or Housing, or whatever it was called that time, to implement all these things. So all those jack on the houses that are still standing today were not built by Julius Baga. <laughs> they were not built by you know uh, Arab contractors. They were not built by they were built by our people, by workers in Lagos State. And for me, that is the model of governance that we need to talk about. The fact that we have indigenous engineers. We have professionals in all fields. So I, I, I'm one of those who always come when people say, oh, the civil service is bloated. We don't need them. We do. We need people in government because they are not just civil servants. Many of them are professionals, but because we have deviated from the foundation that we were laid, and that is why we have you know, this kind of problem. So for me, it's worth emphasizing uh, that, that it was able to run the government. It was able to do all these things at reasonable cost. Because he didn't embark, you know, on the system of, you know, uh, contractocracy as we have it now, or you know, rely on all these things. For me, it's important to emphasize uh, this aspect. Jack on his uh, you know, leadership, and one other thing I also want to talk about, which for, which is also quite equally important, was that his investment in education was just not at the level of cancellation of those uh, shifted systems. And I do remember at the, at the level of free education, Mr. Layok was talking about the governor then saying, "Wait for your time." Jack Conde actually announced and said from October 1, there will be free education. And the governor was saying that, uh, you know, just keep quiet. And Jack Conde said, parents that don't have money to pay school fees should not bother. They shouldn't pay because when it comes in, there will be free education automatically. And that happened. But beyond that, Lagos also produced, you know, teachers. Many may not know that, that in those days, Lagos State, because uh, the Unity Party of Nigeria also belonged to the rank of what they call uh, progressive uh, parties of Nigeria at that time which included uh, the GNPP, the Great Nigerian People's Party that was controlling Bruno State, the People's Redemption Party that was controlling Kano and Kaduna States, and then you had the UPN State. So they came together and had you know, uh, a forum, the Progressive you know, uh, Governors uh, Forum that time. And one of the things they did was also to exchange uh, human resources. And under Jack Day, at least 800 Lagos teachers were sent to Bono State to go and help their educational system because they were disadvantaged. They didn't have enough teachers. <laughs> so it wasn't just that Jacode was you know, producing students. They were also producing teachers, qualified teachers. And the exchange program we had that time was at the level of intellect. To the extent, that like I said, that at least 800 teachers from Lagos State went to Bono State to work. These are facts that could be verified. These were the kind of things that happened uh, under his uh, leadership. So when we say that it's peerless, when we say that it is the model, because at the level of you know Buja politics, I do not think you can have you know a better example of 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 leadership 
that believes in the people, that invests in the people, that the kind of you know, leadership that uh, Jack Conde provided uh, in, in Lagos uh, State. Uh, we, we round off right now. Deepo, in just one, main, in one, one minute, we have to round off on this segment. Let's talk about the laudable F, uh, achievements of uh, late Chief Jack Conde in the area of health in Lagos, and then your final thoughts in, in just a minute, if you can. Yes, because uh, just like uh, the, we have said, Larry said it, Anthony also said it, the achievements of Dr. Conde was predicated <laughs> on the public parties programs. And one of the cardinal programs of DPL, UPN then was the free health service. So all those things that he did at the hospital, that is uh, this, the, what we now know as um, the General Hospital, Lagos State University National Hospital, Biology um, Bank Antonio Hospitals, uh, sorry, hospital. Those are the thing, foundations that were laid by Babaja Kondi. And you said in one minute, I, I, I think when situations like this occur, it must give us an opportunity to do like an introspect. The death of Babaja Kondi, and we are discussing his achievements, which we have tied around his political party, must be, we must begin to again look at our political parties. Can't we have what we call a political party in the real sense? A political party that when you're, you have been made as a governor, as a president, your member or your president, your governor will not deviate because that one is lacking now. You see all manners of program that has nothing to do with the political party. That is why when probably somebody become a governor, they go haywire. You no, know, they are not able to control them. No party is able to control them. So when he is going against the political party's interest, Nobody is going to control him because he has become the all and all in the party and in the state or in the country. So there is the need for us to reassess our political parties. There is the need for us to rejig our political parties to function as a political party so that they can continue to guide the activities of their members anytime they imagine as a governor, a president, a member of House of Representatives, or is a, like a lawmaker or anything. Whatever area you are performing, whatever area you are functioning, you must carry along the political party because the people voted for political party based right, on the manifesto Larry, of the party. We have to but go this, now. I know you have a lot to talk about him, but we have to go now. Thank you so much. Larry Arubudade, Director International. Oh, sorry, Deepo Olayoko, Political Affairs Analyst, and Anoga at the top. Thank you so much for being part of the program this morning. Larry Arubudade, we have to go now. Just your thoughts in 30 seconds uh, as the the late Latif Jacode is late to rest today. Well, we just hope that uh, Jacode will be immortalized uh, deservedly and that uh, a very, very important uh, landmark in Lagos State uh, will be named uh, after him. I've already seen people saying on social media that uh, we have Adekunle Ajasi University in uh, you know, those states. We have uh, Labi Sword of Angel University. So we should be looking at uh, Latif Jacode University or Joe. And I think that uh, last words should be happy and proud if such an institution is named after him. He, he deserves to be celebrated and his life and times, his politics, his media, his journalism needs to be documented for this current generation and for generations to come. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lanri Arugundadi, Director of International Press Center, for taking this walk down memory lane. Thank you so much for joining us on News Help. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Um, I think I would like to get one comment from um, Anthony. Uh, just a summary. Yes, I think um, the life and times of um, Jack Onde gives us um, a template for what leadership should be. And I think that those that are currently in leadership should look at what he has achieved in the course of his leadership and take a cue from there. Absolutely. Right. Thank you so much, Anthony. Well, Anthony will be with us here in the studio. And when we come back from this short break, we'll be talking about something in the line of fixed politics. So much to talk about. After the short break, we'll be back on News Hub. Stay with us. <laughs>